All right, so hello and welcome. My name is Nathan Poirier. I am a doctorate candidate, a doctoral candidate in sociology at Michigan State University. Uh, and I am talking with Marquise Bay today, who is assistant professor of African-American studies and English at Northwestern University, and who is author of four, currently soon to be five books. So hello, Marquise, welcome. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for being here and uh, allowing allowing me and uh, those of you as video your time today. Um, so I think it's worth getting started by asking you a, a question or two, maybe about your background. So I'm pretty interested in. Well, can you, I guess, first describe kind of your research and your your work kind of in general? What are the things you're interested? In? What does it revolve around? Yeah. So for me, I understand my myself and my work at the kind of nexus of of Black feminist theorizing, uh, trans and non-binary studies, abolition, and contemporary African-American literature. Those are the, the things that really suture my work together. Uh, and for me, I am really interested in questions of undoing and undermining and interrogating various ontological uh, mandates, um, various subjective mandates, uh, and how can we exceed those things, get not even necessarily beyond those things, but be to be uh, irreverent toward those requisite for existence, uh, for knowledge, et cetera. Um, so I'm someone who is deeply, deeply invested in or embedded in uh, thinking about how we might, as I come to call it, irrevere various forms and notions of the subject of knowledge, ontology, et cetera, uh, in order for us to pursue and enact different kinds of worlds, otherwise kinds of worlds. So those are the things that really characterize my work and more, but uh, I think those are the central premises of the things that I'm interested in. Sure, yeah, that's that's very cool. And that's a, it's a lot of, kind of a lot of different things um, wrapped together, but I'm, I'm guessing um, that you would kind of view all those various topics and even goals as all connected. Is that true? Absolutely, absolutely. Connected in, to me, uh, ways that are, so if I'm thinking through Black feminist theorizing, trans and non-binary studies, abolition, all those things to me are different inflections of how we might undermine and interrogate various kinds of requisites for existence, for uh, existing in the world, emerging in the world, et cetera. So via the vein of gender, via the vein of race, uh, via the vein of capitalism, all those things, via the vein of the subject, all those things I think have different kinds of histories, discourses, situatednesses. Uh, and I think it's important to address those, uh, attack those in specific kinds of ways, uh, all in service of the undermining of these things that um, go under the heading of, say, white supremacy, cis normativity, patriarchy, et cetera. So there are different inflections for getting at the different ways that, um, that various forms of oppression and hegemony embed in various kinds of ways that we are uh, situated in the world. How can we uh, think about undermining those things in their particularities uh, in service of the abolition of those things? That's what I'm trying to, to do in different kinds of ways. Right, so yes, I, I, I'm a real fan of the sort of the, the subversive current um, that, that you're talking about. So even I think you use the word like indifference in, in, um, irreverent. In, in, yeah, irreverent. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so kind of acting just otherwise to the powers that be, right? According to one's own circumstances and um, agency and abilities. Yeah. So it's a very it focused a lot on sort of autonomy. Um, I might say. So, how I guess what are your thoughts on kind of the the sort of individualist autonomy then versus a, a collective autonomy in, in that sort of respect and. Um, yeah, um, so I'm deeply uninterested in this uh, notion of this discrete individual um, who has autonomy over themselves. I actually don't think that exists. I don't think that's a thing, to be quite honest, um, because there's always for me a coalitional input, coalitional pension, because uh, the things that we are doing uh, in service of radicality, in service of abolition, are also simultaneously in service of a larger coalition. They are not simply about liberating um, ourselves from these things, but we are always embedded in various kinds of network, always enmeshed and entangled. And through that, that for me allows us to think about how might we 
in gender liberation for the collective, the coalition, uh, because that is in many ways who we are. So when I say I, I'm not simply talking about this individuated subject, but I'm talking about how I'm enmeshed and entangled in all these other networks that cultivate and condition my emergence into the world. Uh, so how can I then be in service of that collective, of uh, that conditioning that I am always and already a part of? So it's a deeply coalitional effort, not at all one given to individuation, uh, which itself is a violent instantiation of colonialism. Uh, and I'm deeply, deeply against that, uh, deeply want to be uh, subversive of that. So for me, how then can I be given more toward the coalitional and collective and in service of that, rather than in service of some individuated notion of a self and gaining agency over the self? That to me is not at all the project, not at all the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I um, I remember the, um, oh gosh, whatever it was, the preface maybe to them goon rules yeah. um, had something to do with that. I mean, it had a bit to do with that, how you, you, you were talking very explicitly and, and a bit for a preface. You spent a bit of time in, in something like that, I was pretty sure, on how you were essentially um, stealing ideas, right? mm -hmm. that you were, you were being very open about the originality or perhaps lack thereof um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the writings in that book. And I found that very <clears throat> inspiring. Um, I, I, it's probably, it's got to be the best, I'm calling it the I guess I have the book here. I, I should double check to be to be clear. Whatever that was, um, was yes. Yeah, so it is the preface. Um, but I think for what that is, a preface. It's a very short, you know, often not very deep. I would say introduction, you know, of writing to a book. But yours was, I would say, the best preface I've ever read. Usually, I just read them for general, you know, context and framing of the work. But that particular part from the preface. I think is very inspiring. Um, and so I only just read them Goon Rules, I mean, gosh, early February or something. Um, so, so at this point, uh, you know, it's still February, you know, four weeks ago. Um, but so, so it's, it's very recent, but I, I found that very inspiring that, so you're talking about it largely in terms of thought there, but what you just said is also in terms of, of you know, action maybe. So, so things that we do as individuals are, inherently they end up being products of our relations with other people as well so yeah. the idea especially in like academics of claiming a particular work to be your own is very maybe at best arrogant and at worst it's completely wrong yeah absolutely and i talk about this actually in the acknowledgments of the new book the black trans feminism book uh yeah. because it is deeply arrogant and disingenuous to, to presume that this work that has my name on it uh, is the product of all the intellectual labor that I alone did. Uh, that's deeply disingenuous because on the one hand, I'm here because a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of things and a whole bunch of conditions allow me to be here. So I'm always and already in service of, of that and embedded and indebted to that. And then on the other hand, I'm citing people. I've learned from people. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been cared for by people. I've been cared for by family and kin uh, and friends who do dishes for me or clean for me uh, when I'm trying to, to write this thing. So like the very environment that I find myself in, the land that I find myself on and amongst, uh, it's it's all of those things are caring for me in a really deep way that conditioned my ability to even write this thing. So there's no way that I can ever think individualistically because I'm always embedded in all these various kinds of kinship networks um, that exceed the human, that exceed these uh, hegemonic notions of relationality that exceed all these hierarchies of human animal. Uh, all these things are embedded in the way that I am able to even show up and emerge into the world to do the things that quote unquote I purportedly do. So it's always a coalitional effort for me, always. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's really cool talking about that and thinking about that because individuals end up being involved in so many things mm -hmm but all of those end up being yeah, collective endeavors. And so it's, it's, um, it's just good to not only be aware of that um, as an individual, I guess, but then to work with it like you are and through that, um, like you are and you're talking about is, is a different thing. Um, but obviously you're doing that and, and it's very inspiring for me personally as well to realize that. Um, and uh, yeah, just 
it's it's a very it's a very humbling experience but it's actually very uh, maybe not empowering but but in a way i think maybe you know fulfilling um uh, to to recognize that as well is that um we're not we're not acting alone as if you know we could somehow be like lonely in our actions but we are acting with and through others and i think this it just feels very good to know we you know we we have those networks that we're automatically embedded in so there are others that we're working with and alongside yeah it's deeply humbling deeply deeply humbling because then you uh, begin to to write and think and feel uh, always in relation with other people. Um, begin to think about how what you do and say and think affects other people. How you show up uh, in a way that then impacts other people. Uh, so there's a there's a deeply humbling uh, and expanding way that this recognition allows me to then emerge into the world in a different kind of way. Yeah. Yep. And and so you mentioned it a couple. Of a minute ago about how people who even you know people would influence you even if they you know did in particular i'm thinking of like doing dishes for, for mm -hmm. you that that you said among other things um but so it, it is interesting to think about that how people who are very much perhaps in the background in that sort of sense doing dishes for you perhaps so that you are available to do something else right so that in doing that something else it might seem like an individual effort because you are doing it but you might only be able to because someone else is taking care of another part of your life for you and that of course also in particular dishes is is of course like historically associated with you know women's work as well the women that's unpaid labor idea of that's what they do so that men were able to do manly things right um but uh of course that whole notion is trash but um realizing that whoever's doing the dishes um it's it, you know there's still a collective effort going on there and and i think it's just such a mundane task but you bringing it up like that makes it i think imbues it with a certain importance yeah even the the most mundane of, of tasks uh, i think are the building blocks of being able to do not so mundane tasks and so like even just like i was thinking the other day about how many nails and screws uh, are in the the home that i live in and how those small things literally allow me to stand upright how the soil allows me to to stand upright all these small things that we don't even think about uh, are not mundane at all but in fact i think are fundamental to how we are even able to to be and live and move and so i want to try to as best i can heed those things heed the fundamental mentality of those things in the way that I move through the world. Um, so how to do that isn't always an open question, um, but noting that I think is really important and something that is often not done. Yeah, that's that's a good point and a good, I think, cor um, corrective to what I was saying is that the mundane isn't, it's maybe a bad name for it, it's not so mundane, it's actually pretty central mm -hmm. um, and fundamental. Um, it, 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 that reminds me very much of uh, um, Chaira uh, Batichi, who just uh, recently last year came out the book Anarch Feminism, and in it, in the in the middle third, they're kind of building their anarcho feminism on this idea of trans individuality, mm -hmm. um, which has a lot to do with. I think it's very related to what you are saying because even even Chaira goes into the non-human and the 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 work of and between humans and non-humans like the soil or nails and how those things how we all interact to to to, to form i guess whatever sort of life or events that unfold um so it's just when i when i think of your preface and then goon rules that that this started talking about and, and chira's well the trans um trans philosophy or trans individualism isn't their idea, but they're they're building on it for a, an idea of anarcho-feminism, but that largely has to, um, is what it's about too, yeah. Um, but it's just a really cool thought, I think too, that again, isn't isn't things people typically think about, even those who are more collective collectivist or whatnot um, oriented. Yeah, and this is, I think this to me reminds me of, uh, in a different vein, uh, but their resonances between the two, um, but, uh, something idea Hartman calls the uh, the unthought. Uh, so the ways that the unthought, uh, the things that are not only not thought about but expunged from the province of proper thinking, uh, often are the foundation of what allows us to to think. So how can we move toward thinking about the unthought uh, as a thing or as things that are deeply embedded in how we 
are permitted to do and say the things that we do and say. Um, so moving toward that, I think, could be a really, really helpful direction to go into, um, because that then allows us to begin to think about those otherwise possibilities, uh, imagining different kinds of things and possibilities for ourselves. Yes, yeah, and so it's it's really cool you bring up um, Hartman, who I'm not particularly familiar with yet, but I've come across their name recently, and I'm, I'm I will try to get get to them. There, you know, there's so many people in works, but um, it, you know, another thing I realize is, is what you're talking about, and then and then you bring up Hartman is is adding to the conversation further, is that uh, you you get this idea that we've been talking about now. Um, well, I've encountered it a lot more in terms of, I think, proportion of writings. Um, this idea of community or working with and through others, including non-human others in black writers or indigenous writers, right? But you, I don't see this nearly as often from white writers. It's something I've realized as I've gotten into um, more non-white authors um, and, uh, and movements. So I think that's something interesting to realize as well, maybe maybe you would disagree, but um, I think that's certainly something I would say I found, and it's something that continues to draw me to non-white authors um, of all stripes, and to look for more diversity, you know, within those authors that I want, you know, am, am interested in. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. I would deeply agree with that uh, because okay. there is. I mean, this is how I tend to understand uh, if we're thinking in these terms, thinking about blackness and thinking about whiteness, for example, to me, whiteness, and I would, and I often try to make this distinction. Uh, so rather than, and this is, this is me, and this is deeply, deeply uh, about the kind of lineage, uh, intellectual, sociopolitical lineage that I follow, making this distinction between, say, white people, white writers, and people who think they are or believe in or invest in whiteness. That's the distinction I always try to make. And it seems to me that those who invest in or are uh, given to or thinking of themselves via whiteness, huh? that emerges precisely when one attempts to emerge as an individuated subject. Uh, and that has all these violences inherent to it. Uh, but for me, I'm understanding blackness uh, as, a, as, as a really, really given toward the social or sociality, huh? which is understood in a whole bunch of different kinds of ways. But I think by virtue of those things, there is then a disposition toward uh, thinking about the coalitional communal via Blackness uh, and then the way that individuation and autonomous selves are given toward people who understand themselves through or in proximity to, to whiteness. So when we think about the, the traditions of say the black radical tradition or decolonial traditions, uh, there's always to me, it seems a social component, coalitional component because there is not at all this fantasy that one can be this individuated, individuated subject. There's not this fantasy that one can or even should aspire to whiteness. So how then do we promote and proliferate that even for those who might be understood or have been understood as say phenotypically white? How can we place a demand on all of us to be given toward that coalitional penchant and movement? Because uh, that's the thing for me that I think differentiates me from a good amount of people. Uh, I am someone who really wants to place a demand on everyone to get in on, let's say, the decolonial, the Black radical tradition, because for me, it's an open plenum uh, in which if you want to enter into it, uh, you can, whoever you are, uh, but it will require of you a fundamental and radical change and shift. And I want us to take up that task. And I think for me, the Black radical tradition is not this parochial project, uh, but one that is asking of everyone, are you ready to take up that task? Uh, and how we answer that is then how we show up in the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. I think that's very well said. Um, yeah, and so so listening to you, I, I think it's very interesting because I I kind of come to your work more through anarchism. Yeah. Uh, so I first found out about you through Anarcho Blackness, um, that book of yours, and so I was reading it for a, a sort of a non-white perspective on anarchism. That's what I was originally using it for, and then reading it, that, that's not exactly the case. That's kind of not 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 your point with that book. Um, which you address, but then move on very quickly from, um, which I found very interesting and, and, and very cool. Um, but so listening to you speak, like you just did, um, 
someone who is acquainted with anarchism can hear the, I think I would say like the anarchy behind what you are saying. Um, and uh, I just think that's really cool. I, I don't know. I don't know, I guess, how else to phrase it. So like, you're not just like you say in anarcho-blackness, you're not just like refashioning anarchism in a black way or, or from a black viewpoint. You are sort of living anarchies, anarchy through blackness. Is that yeah. accurate? That's a wonderful way to put it. I think a really, really yeah. wonderful way to put it um, because I, yeah, I find myself really exhausted, I'll say, uh, with the, the ways that to, there's a presumption, it feels, uh, where to designate uh, a, like Marxism, for example, or anarchism or whatever, uh, and then put, say, Black in front of it. Uh, there's a way that that's exhausting to me uh, because it's often just that this is, done by white folks uh, and we need to have it done by black folk because it will be inherently better you know, I guess okay sure uh, but not really for me uh, what I'm interested in is how blackness is not an identitarian term uh, but rather a, a radicalizing term uh, one that that is a provocation uh, one that uh, it allows us not simply to point to people who are understood as Black and see when they are doing Marxism or anarchism or feminism, uh, but how can we actually mine and interrogate the very sinews uh, and uh, structures of these, these things? How can we think about the ways that we might radicalize these, not simply in terms of the racializing, uh, but rather in terms of how can we, in fact, in fact, bring about the abolition of all these various structures, normativities, hegemonies, etc. That to me is what blackness uh, and also transness uh, and black feminism, these, th these names are not identitarian, but things that inflect a radicality. Uh, so how can we then think through that uh, and getting to, and this is why I, uh, I understand myself very deeply via abolition, because uh, that's, the, that's the terminology and phrasing and framework that I often use um, as, a, as a way to understand what I'm attempting to, to get at. Abolition to me, which is deeply embedded in anarchism, uh, as we know, uh, abolition allows me and permits me to think about, to not be enamored at all with this world and its coordinates of being, its grammars, but to really, really emphasize and find joyful what other kinds of ungrammars or non-worlds there are outside of, of this one. That's the thing that is really exciting to me. And I get at that and I'm invited into that via something like anarchism or abolition. It allows me to really, really think about why are we so invested in these kinds of structures uh, when they are not the only kinds of ways that we can live? Uh, and in fact, uh, they, are, they are attempting to stanch the possibility of other ways to live by way of trying to presume themselves natural, divine, uh, orderly. What happens when we decline that? Uh, and what other things open up when we decline that? That's the thing to me that's so enticing, so enticing. It allows for us a really scary, but also really joyful, boisterous possibility of otherwise ways of emerging uh, into and outside of the world. And that's the thing I'm always trying to seek. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And so again, you, you make a good point that's, um, I think, not made so much, um, that it's not just about declining something, or maybe, you know, maybe a whole thing, a bunch of things, but the possibilities that I don't know, I don't know what the other form of that of declining would be declination or, you know, what, um, what declining opens up. So there's that flip side, that positive, that more creative side um, of not just uh, ignoring something, declining something, turning your back on something, but also that means turning towards something else and creating uh, something else. And so it would seem like therein kind of lies the activist, maybe implications of things that you're talking about and things like perhaps well, the wider things you're talking about, maybe of either of, of abolition, right? Yeah. We, we want to get rid of uh, various things get rid of patriarchy, right? Get rid of the, the prison industrial complex, but we don't just dismantle those. The point is to then create these alternate, uh, inclusive, positive forms of living and relating um, and, and healing. Absolutely, yeah, because abolition, and this is, this is, this seems like an axiom in abolition studies, abolition circles, but abolition is creative, very much so, huh? yeah. because if we get rid of 
not even just prison, but carcerality, because that's the thing, that's the distinction that I think we need to make. We get rid of carcerality, which looks like, of course, prison and the prison industrial complex. That then is a call to think about, okay, how are we going to redistribute these resources, these funds, uh, and how can we embed these more in, say, forms of education, which is not to say schools, because also schools have within them logics of carcerality. So we need to also rethink how we understand education, of how we uh, begin to, to distribute resources to uh, mental health services, social services, all these different kinds of things that it seems to me prisons uh, are doing a terrible, terrible job at attempting to, to remedy all the societal harms, et cetera, uh, are, I think, much more, I know, much, much more uh, aided when we think about how uh, we can address various forms of, of harm that are not punitive in carceral, but rather how can we proliferate life chances? How can we proliferate joy? All these things that I think would then be much, much more fruitful for our world. So it's not simply about tearing things down, uh, but it's about how we can, how can we engender a world in which forms of carcerality are impossible, in which the world that we create is predicated on the impossibility of those forms of carcerality. That's the thing uh, that I think abolition is moving us toward, not simply the destruction, uh, but deeply, deeply the creative. Yeah, and so it, it would seem like that kind of thing needs to be stated, maybe. I don't know, I'm very much thinking through this, not trying to state anything authoritatively, um, but that when, you know, abolition, I think in general, has that negative connotation of getting rid of something. That, that's like what it means is my under, my understanding of it. Um, and so I think when when other people who maybe don't engage with these topics so much, you know, hear about abolition or even anarchism, technically, right, the etymologically is supposed to mean I, I sort of against authority or against hierarchy. So again, that negative sense. Um, but both of these, these concepts have the, the positive component to them. So it seemed like people who write or talk about these concepts need to insert that perhaps every time, just to be clear, to help kind of combat that. And maybe, or I don't know, or just use a sort of different language um, to, to perhaps avoid that. Yeah, I think that'd be really, really helpful for sure, um, especially with the relative general newness of these discourses. I think that's really important uh, because also it feels to me not obvious so much, uh, but to be against authority uh, is not to simply understand authority as this thing telling someone or someone's what to do, uh, but to understand authority and authoritativeness and authoritarianism as inherently violent uh, and oppressive and negating. So to be against that to me, is inherently affirming, uh, life affirming. So I think excavating that and proliferating that uh, that understanding of it, I think, can really make this make it a, a lot more clear uh, that this is not simply about saying no to things, but saying yes to a certain kind of life, saying yes to other kinds of possibilities for people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you mind if uh, we switch gears just slightly and I ask you about a couple? Um, well, sort of particular uh, mm -hmm. uh, things that that that, uh, that you come across in your book that are books that I'm just uh, um, interested in maybe hearing a little bit more about. Absolutely. Um, I think and so one of the things you say, I believe it comes from anarcho blackness, uh, was um, I don't have that. I have the book, but I don't. I don't think I have the particular passage, and it might not have even been a particular passage, but more of a you know sort of right. not drawn out as in like too long, but a more lengthy. Right. Um, statement on this but so i believe you say that black feminism itself is radical mm -hmm. and perhaps inherently radical and i guess i was just uh wondering if you would mind kind of explaining that a little bit more why do you view black feminism as long as of course i'm correct if there's anything to correct me on please do that but um why would you say black feminism is radical in and mm -hmm. of itself yeah so i can give a, i'll try to give a succinct answer to to this so Black feminism, we need to be clear, is not simply feminism being done by Black people or Black women specifically. That's not all it is, like at all, to me at least. Uh, it feels to me, and I understand Black feminism as uh, not simply feminism in Black, but the, the insistence on the violence of gender as such, racialized gender as such, and thus the undermining and interrogation of that. And then if that is the case, then it feels to me 
also following from that, that the radicality comes in the rejection of an insistence on something outside of this fundamental normative hegemonic structure. So if the normative structure, hegemonic structure, is an adherence to various criteria of racialized gender, uh, then radical would be to get outside, to opt out of that, uh, or to interrogate and critique that, that fundamental ontological, epistemological way of understanding ourselves in the world. Um, and radical then is a, I'm understanding or defining radical as the, the various modes through which we get outside of and opt out of, critique, interrogate, subvert normativity and hegemony. If racialized gender is normative, is hegemonic, Black feminism serves as an interrogation of that and is seeking various possibilities for getting outside of that. That's how I'm understanding Black feminism as kind of inherent radicality. And of course, there are different understandings of Black feminism, sure. Uh, there might be other understandings of Black feminism that don't appear so radical. Um, but in the way that I'm understanding Black feminism via a whole bunch of people, namely someone like Hortense Villers, Alexa Pauline Gunn, Denise Ferreira da Silva, all these wonderful, wonderful Black feminist scholars and thinkers, uh, I think Black feminism via that line of thinking is inherently radical be precisely because it rejects the normativity of racialized gender. Ah, OK, yeah, so that's um, that makes it clearer to me, for sure. And I was definitely, I would have described it differently. Um, I don't think there's much of a need to get into my viewpoint. I'm much more concerned about your viewpoints. Um, but uh, I think it would have been related, but not not what you would have said. Um, so, so I think that's uh, it's really helpful for helping to, helping to kind of correct my thinking about that and understand mm -hmm. black feminism and your writing and others a little better. So, yeah, that was that's very helpful. Um, and so another thing that is related to that is in them goon rules. So you talk about well, it came from a conversation you had with with somebody in there about the term intersectionality, and in particular. Um, so not necessarily about that term itself, but what you what you do say in that book is that intersectional feminism tries to be black, mm -hmm. but it essentially ultimately always fails. Um, and so, I guess that also I, I would be I'd be wondering if you could maybe explain on that a little bit more because at least when I think about intersectionality, I always think about black feminism. So that mm -hmm. it. it originated in Black feminism to describe Black women's situation. So when I read something like intersectional feminism tries but fails to be Black, um, you know, th that's a little bit of, for me, I, I can't put those pieces together exactly. So would you be able to shed some more light on that? Absolutely. And I talk about this explicitly in the introduction of the Black trans feminism book, which just came mm -hmm. out. So, okay. So as I, as I, as I noted, uh, I'm understanding blackness in a, in a reconfigured way, and we can get into all of that. Uh, and I can quote all of Fred Moten and Hortense Fillers and all these wonderful people, uh, but I'm not going to do that right now. We don't have to do that right now. So I'm reconfiguring blackness. It's not simply about a particular phenotype or racialized identity. That's not what it's about for me. Um, mm -hmm. So when I say that intersectional feminism tries but fails to be black feminism, uh, what I'm trying to allude to is the ways that that intersectional feminism is fine, it is, and I don't want to be misunderstood as maligning or lambasting intersectional feminism or intersectionality. Um, but to me, it, it has grown cozy with, comfortable with the presumption that these categories that are intersecting our mainstays, our natural, have clear delimitations. And I'm not so sure about that. I'm actually quite skeptical about that. Uh, so I want to then begin to think about, and so the, the metaphor I give in the Black Trans Feminism book is uh, intersectional feminism or intersectionality presumes that the only bad part or the only misstep was the crash that happened at the intersections. What I want to think about is also what's happening on the sidewalks, uh, what's the temperature outside, what kind of sounds are happening, who made streets and roads uh, in this way in the first place, who made, the, made up the ideas of miles per hour, uh, what kind of, uh, what happened that made this person uh, go past this stop sign or this red light, all these other kinds of 
of sensoria that we need to attune to in order to understand what's happening. It's not simply that this crash happened at the intersection of Crenshaw and Lake Street, uh, but rather all these other things that are impacting what is even possible. So how then can we reconfigure what roads look like? Uh, what kind of things are we attuned to? Uh, and that to me is what's indexed in Blackness. Uh, this uh, capacious sensoria uh, about all these other things that are occurring, that are happening, that have happened. Uh, and I want to be more attuned to, to that uh, because that to me is the, the thing or the things that we also need to be thinking about and, and being privy of. So. Yeah, I, again, this is not to say that I dislike and hate intersectionality, I'm not at all to say that, um, but I I guess I want to uh, press on it more. I want to press on it more and I want to uh, expand it, make it more capacious, give it more breath uh, to think about all these other things that in fact are a part of the ways that uh, that people, that things, modalities interact rather than simply the intersection of streets, but there are so many other things, so many other things. And of course, I would be remiss uh, to not mention my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Nash, uh, whose book, Black Feminism Reimagined After Intersectionality uh, is where I'm getting a lot of this from. Uh, that book, I think, does a phenomenal, phenomenal job of giving a treatment of intersectionality, where its gaps are, et cetera, in a really sustained, clear, sober, calculated way. Um, so I want to also amplify you know, Jen Nash's work as well. Yeah, cool. I am aware of that book and um, and Nash. I haven't read the book, but you bring. I've come across it. Chira, who I mentioned earlier on anarcho-feminism, has some sort of critique of Nash. Um, I, I think it's very sympathetic. Um, uh, but now, so now I really want to read Nash. Um, I'm just uh, yeah, very curious, and I, I I also consider myself. I feel like I should be clear. I'm very interested in. Uh, in studying issues of race and, and black feminism in particular and, and things, but I in no way consider myself an expert um, or anything like that, but I'm certainly constantly exploring and constantly intrigued. And in fact, more and more, the more I look into this stuff, these, these ideas, these uh, fields and whatnot, the more I like it. Um, so I certainly don't want to come off as if I think I am or know more than I do, um, but so, uh, yeah, now I'm really interested in reading Nash. There's a lot of authors and, and things I haven't gotten to, um, but uh, so you've been my primary vehicle, at least very recently, into this sort of work. Um, and so we are also speaking on February 26th, and your book, Black Trans Feminism, has just come out. Um, I don't know exactly when, but I actually did just receive a copy a couple of days ago. Um, so I haven't had a chance to read it. So the fact that you maybe are, are reiterating some of that. Um, I haven't gotten to it yet, but um, uh, plan on doing that very soon. Um, so yeah, that book seems um, pretty phenomenal. And so if if maybe if maybe you you I I'd like to ask about well that book very generally mm -hmm. compared to perhaps especially them goon rules, mm -hmm. um, but also a little bit of anarcho blackness. So I know you know them goon rules has the the subtitle of fugitive essays on radical black feminism. And in anarcho-blackness, you bring in a bit of trans, a trans perspective mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I'm just curious, how is black trans feminism with those three, those three words in it uh, different from the previous writings, which also combine blackness, transness, and feminism? Yeah, so black trans feminism is a deep and sustain and long meditation on the concatenation between these two terms, uh, which again, are not identitarian. And I wanna emphasize that point too, because it would be very easy uh, for someone to think that Black trans feminism is a book about Black trans women and talking about Black trans women and amplifying the voices of Black trans women and the knowledge of the Black trans women, et cetera. That's not all it's about at all, really. Uh, it's about how do these two terms or these three terms, uh, how do they necessitate a different orientation to the very grammars of life and livability? How do they make necessary and uh, require 
uh, a different way of organizing or disorganizing how we relate to and emerge in the world. So again, I reconfigure and recalibrate how I'm understanding Blackness, transness, and Black feminism and feminist theory uh, via different modalities and inflections of a certain kind of radicality. Uh, so Blackness then is understood not as simply um, a racialized identity, um, but given toward a disposition for the irregular and unregulated. The trans is, is understood as this uh, in, in incisive critique and interrogation of the very grammars of the gender binary and gender normativity. And then feminism or Black feminism is understood as a declining of racialized gender and its mandate. So if I'm understanding these terms in these ways, that then means that I think it's, it's important for us to really rethink what's possible in the world uh, and what we need to let go of. This is, again, me using uh, Jennifer Nash's language, the language of certain uh, radical strains of Black feminism. Uh, and for me, the underlying fundament of Black trans feminism are, is twofold uh, via abolition and via a certain kind of gender radicality. Uh, so through those things, I am trying to dig out or carve out a way of insisting on insisting on the I want to put it in these terms uh, kind of staring into the abyss uh, being held by all these other people but staring into the abyss of what if we let go of all these taxonomic categorizations all these normative ways of understanding ontology and relationality what if we let go of all those things staring to the abyss of unknownness and unknowability and uncertainty and leap what happens then? Uh, and it seems to me that Black trans feminism, in its uh, interrogation of all these fundamental grammar, we are left with a whole bunch of other things that we don't know of yet. And I think I want to encourage us to fugitively hope into that abyss. That's what Black trans feminism is attempting to do in a whole bunch of different kinds of ways via a whole bunch of different avenues. Uh, but that's the thing that it seems to me is, is pressing for, for me, for Black trans feminism as a project. Uh, and the answer or what happens after we make that leap is entirely open, uh, viciously and terrifyingly so. Uh, but I think that's the call, that's the man. I think we owe it to ourselves uh, to yearn for and desire that uh, rather than this, because this has been killing us for so long, has violated us in so many ways. I think we owe it to ourselves to see what else there might be, uh, precisely because it is not this. And that's the thing I want to try to examine uh yeah examine in mind for whatever might be there i don't know we don't know uh, but i think something fruitful even simply in its its unknowability and it's other than thisness uh, i think it's it's fruitful and beneficial to to examine and explore yeah yeah it's it's so exciting listening to you speak um and and just just like it is to read your books i mean I don't know if I sound like a broken record or if I just keep bringing things back to myself unnecessarily, but I, I really just get so like excited and inspired reading, reading your stuff. I mean, that's, I think those are the words for it. And it just makes me, you know, honestly, like right now, I'm not saying I want to end this talk, but just right now, go start Black trans feminism. I mean, um, it's, it's just got me very, very fired up about this stuff. Um, and I, like, I have a special, a graduate specialization in women's and gender studies, but we, I really, really, uh, really did not encounter work like you are talking about and referencing in that specialization. So like we would talk, we would touch on things like black feminism um, or other sorts of feminisms, you know, sometimes the word is, um, or the phrase is third world feminisms, you know, or something like that. But none of them that, that we read is at least, you know, part of the institutionalized higher education seem to be as radical uh, and as inspiring as as what you're talking about and so and how we are talking and I guess I just um, that's a that's a, it's unfortunate you know and I really wish uh, and hope that that people who teach things like gender or women's studies courses and whatnot will incorporate your work because I would love to and like I will be recommending your work to professors I know at my institution um, to build that into courses. And I, I wish I could go back and take a course where your work is part of it. I mean, it would just be so great to discuss this with others as well. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you know, you'd be the best to discuss your work with, but 
um, it's just, it's, it's probably more radical than a lot of professors really want to engage with too. I, I'm partly guessing. I mean, it's newer, to be fair, your, your books are, are, you know, more recent, but um, yeah, I mean, it would just be great to have this as, as part of courses too. I mean, it just, I want to, I, I want to help it get out there, you know, um, so not just the, you know, the, the professionals or um, professors reading this, but I think students should be brought up in this kind of tradition as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. That's, that's such a, that's such a generous thing for you to say. So I really appreciate that. And I think you're, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, there's a different era, a different generation, if you want to call it that. Of, of scholars, of thinkers, of activists, of scholar activists who are doing work that I that I am also doing, uh, and I think, in part at least, it seems to be a uh, a response to something. I'm going to cite Sadia Hartman again. Uh, something Sadia Hartman says. She's talking specifically about Black liberation, uh, but I also think about this in the vein of something like Black trans feminism or radicality via kind of abolitionist uh, lens. Uh, and she says that uh, it makes us freer than we actually want to be. And that resonated with me so much. There are so many ways that people demand freedom. And like when we actually, uh, and we can, we can quibble over what the actually means, but when we actually present the possibility of that kind of freedom, that kind of radical freedom, that kind of freeness, uh, we cower in fear because perhaps it might be too free. But I want to go there and see what happens, because um, I think in going there, we might be presented with something we didn't even know existed, we didn't even know was mm -hmm. possible. So let's see what that's like. Uh, and I want to I want to see what that's like. So perhaps my work is just an elaborated seeing what that's like. Uh, and I think so far, at least, it's been it's been really cool. It's been really really cool. Yeah, um, yeah, that's awesome. So you, you you're talking about how you're representing the at least partly maybe some of the work reflecting and also presenting. I think some of the work you'd like to see, right? How, how you'd like to sort of see things engaged with and done. And you and so you talk about kind of being drawn to the radical mm -hmm. end of like a continuum, for lack of a better metaphor. And I think that's really cool. I'm I'm like that way too. Is if you know, as I as I read something, and get a taste of extra radicality, get oh that's cool. I want some more. And then you know you so you get into something that's like harder, so to speak, or more radical. And then you're like, oh that's cool. I want some more. Like you know, keep going in that direction. And I think that does not work for a lot of people though. At least I don't know what to call them. More mainstream, typical people who maybe study gender and and I you know took some of these courses and talked to some of these professors at my institution and that was my impression when they speak of radical feminism they they usually mean socialist feminism and in particular that means white socialist feminism mm -hmm. um and I, I tried to bring this up in a course one time and um it really didn't go anywhere as a part of a course discussion and that just was a I mean it's only my limited experience but just kind of a lesson of like these people don't want to be they don't actually want to be radical. And I feel like stuff, this sort of education should start, should be based in the more radical stuff. And so instead of like easing people into it or something like that, start with the most extreme, let them know it's there. Because I feel or else other, other people, they just get too comfortable with the easier stuff, right? And aren't willing to face the more radical. But if they start there, at least they have to be aware of it. And like you said, I think it opens up the most possibilities as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's I mean, doing radical work, doing the work is hard. Uh, thinking is yeah. hard. Uh, all these things are difficult. Uh, and I think many people don't want to do that tough, difficult work. Uh, and there are ways also that I, we've been trained in certain kind of ways uh, or disposed in certain kind of ways of thinking that are okay with the difficulty of that. Perhaps that's also a part of it too. Um, but again, I want to continue to place a demand on people. Like how can we all show up to do the work that we can do where we're at uh, and also to move uh, to different kinds of places in the work that we are called to do. Uh, so I want to, yeah, I want to, I want to insist on the difficulty of this because it's difficult because it's deeply important. Uh, and also because all these normative systems and regimes are attempting to disallow that, that work to be done. It's difficult because we've been swimming in all these normative regimes, hegemonic modes of being and thinking, and it's, it's hard to get out of that. Uh, but I think we are, uh, 
it's imperative for us to get out of that. And that's going to be hard to do. Um, but I'm hoping, and this is why I'm so committed to uh, thinking about this via coalition, I'm hoping that we can help each other in that. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, being in community in coalition with other people allows us, permits us to do that difficult work. We're not alone in that work. We can have our hands held while we're doing that work uh, with other people. Uh, so I want I want to continue to insist on that. I do that with my students. I do that with other faculty, with colleagues. Um, that that difficult work is is meaningful work, uh, and it's important work, and it's difficult for a reason. Uh, so I want to continue to insist on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one way to help insist on that would be rooting um, uh, uh, feminist or gender studies in the radical tradition. Right. Then, then at least students have less of an excuse um, mm -hmm. because they've at least been exposed to it. And if they turn away, there's more responsibility on that rather mm -hmm. than if they've never been presented and no one's talking about it in their circles. Then I think there's a little more, you know, of understanding that it's just not in their realm of sight. But if it's cent you know, centered in that somehow, then there's less, less excuse. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so I have a little bit of a different question here for you, still related definitely in, in all the things we're talking about. But so earlier you mentioned like human, non-human hierarchies. And so critical animal studies, at least among you know, other groups and certainly individuals, likes to, to really kind of have as a foundational principle or um, thing to follow is veganism, right? mm -hmm. or particularly not. I suppose it's particularly not eating animals, but veganism is not limited to that. And mm -hmm. um, and it's, I would say more real, more genuine sense veganism is exceedingly wide. It would include being anti-racist and, and, and multiple other things. Um, but so I'm just curious, since you mentioned that hierarchy, um, kind of how, how might you see veganism fitting into the, the sorts of things you're interested in and, and talking about, if at all? Yeah, um, it's not something that shows up explicitly in my work at all. Uh, but, but I will say that I think in the ways that I'm thinking, if I can try to uh, make apparent one of the links I see between between my work in this, uh, I think if we're understanding or if I'm understanding uh, my project, my projects uh, as really attempting to reconfigure uh, and tinker with who we understand as kin. Uh, I think that's one of the real fundamental tenets uh, if I'm recalibrating all these terms uh, in order to uh, establish a coalition. That coalition extends to, and that coalition might be understood as um, the broadening of kinship, uh, kinship network, kinship relationalities and affinities and affiliations. Uh, that then I think means that we have to steadfastly dismantle these hierarchies of who it's possible to be kin with. Uh, it's not just other quote unquote humans, because we also, we also have to note the historical and contemporary ways that certain racialized populations are, are not granted the status of human necessarily. Uh, so how then can that open up a way of broadening kinship uh, into thinking about, say, non-human animals, though these terms are always already fraught and vexed. Uh, so it seems that veganism um, might then bleed into and seep into uh, my project because it then places an emphasis on broadening who we understand as kin, who we understand as part of the coalition, which then means who we then ha have a, uh, an ethical relationship to. Uh, and broadening that ethical relationality um, to include literally everything, literally everything, mm -hmm. everyone, all things, um, because all things are part of and constitute our ability to move in the world with one another, constitute indeed the world. Uh, so broadening that kinship, that ethical relation, I think is deeply tied to, to veganism because it, to me at least in my very limited reading, uh, it demands that we do not place these hierarchies uh, in normative structures of what qualifies or doesn't qualify as something that uh, is owed an ethical relationship to. If everything is owed an ethical relationship to, that then demands that we give thought to, to what, how, when, where we consume things, how we move and how we impact the world, how we impact others, all that stuff I think is, is present here. So I think that's the, the most apparent tie I see between veganism and my own work. 
Yeah, all right, very, yeah, very interesting. Um, cool, so I uh, also want to ask, um, I don't know, I feel like I just need to keep thinking about that and, and don't necessarily have the skills or the words right now to continue that particular uh, okay. question, but um, is, is, is just very interesting. Um, yeah. I really appreciate that answer. Um, but so in general for your work, um, you have, well, so you still have one book forthcoming, mm -hmm. right? System Failure. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's going to be what, five books for you in four years? Right, four calendar yes. years yes it is oh so, do you plan on keeping that pace up or <laughs> ah, that is a wonderful, a wonderful 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 question um i don't know i mean i i will say i am in the works on uh a on book six uh and that's been fun. i'm thinking about uh gender abolition in a more explicit way via uh non-binariness uh, so that's the that's book six mm -hmm. i don't know when that's coming out uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to keep up this pace. Uh, I still because I I was talking with a, a colleague about this uh, the other day, a few days ago actually, uh, that the pace and speed at which I've written the past four or five years um, has been the product of a certain kind of urgency. Um, my work is given toward a certain kind of urgency because um, people are imperiled. Uh, it feels to me that people uh, in life needs or or is is yearning for desiring. Uh, a different way of thinking and moving uh, that I think my work is delivering upon, which is not to say that things won't be urgent after my work is out, uh, but but that uh, for me, it was an urgent political call to, to do this kind of writing. Uh, I was seeing and encountering and feeling so many different kinds of things. It felt to me that if the thing that I can do is right, uh, then I wanted to attend to that urgency uh, in those demands and those politics. Uh, so. The, the pace was deeply a part of that. Um, so maybe also with academic uh, pressures and responsibilities ratcheting up, um, my pace will likely slow for sure because uh, I have all these other things that I'm doing. But also I'm thinking about the ways that if say the Black Trans Feminism book was like the book that I spent the most time on, has spent the most ink and hours and reading on, uh, if that is now out in the world, uh, I feel that I now have fewer things to say. Uh, I have so many things to say that I wanted to say, and I've said a lot of those things, so I just have fewer things to say now, uh, and I'm hoping then that this allows me, this frees me up to do a different kind of work for people. So even if my mm -hmm. uh, pace slows, uh, which I imagine it will because of various reasons, uh, I, I do hope that my the work that I do will emerge in other realms. Maybe I'll do a different kind of teaching. Maybe I'll do more. And I've been doing uh, prison education for goodness, five years now, for five years now. Maybe I'll do uh, that differently or do more of that. Or maybe I'll do a different kind of community work. Uh, so having written these books does not simply mean that my pace will slow and I'm done, but rather having written these books frees me up to do work in different realms uh, for different kinds of uh, people, beings, entities. And so I'm hoping the shift will not mean that I do less work, but mean that I do work in different kinds of ways. And so, yeah, so there is a book six sometime on the way. I don't know when, mm -hmm. two, three, four years. I don't know. Um, there's definitely a book six. Um, there will very likely be a book seven. Don't know what it's about, but I'm toying with some intellectual rumblings right now. Don't know what's going to happen after that. I don't know if there will be a book eight, uh, what that book would be. I don't know, uh, but there will absolutely be seven total books at least. There will likely be more, but I don't know what those books are. Uh, but I'm also hoping that I'll be able to do work in different kinds of, of ways, either in and, in and around uh, the university that I'm at right now, uh, in and around the community that I find myself uh, in, uh, with different kinds of, of people uh, that I'll be encountering because my books are traveling in different kinds of ways. Um, I actually just had a conversation with someone who was interested in translating the Black Trans Feminism book into German. Uh, so oh, that'll wow. allow me to, to have different kinds of conversations too. Uh, so I'm excited for those kinds of things. I'm excited for the ways that my writing will open up different kinds of doors for me to do work in different kinds of ways. So yeah, I'm excited for that. So the pace will likely slow. Uh, but the work I'm hoping will not slow. It'll just look differently. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I was just curious because it is it is you know quite a bit, um, but it's all. I mean, exciting. You know, um, certainly certainly for me. So I definitely hope others are are feeling that way and continue to feel that way. So I look forward to those other, uh, you know, outward things that you do that you that you will do the the publications. But um, certainly trying to follow you in the way I can generally, even if it's uh, you know not through the books all the time, but uh, somehow certainly interested in following you throughout your career you've, you've certainly you've definitely become a, a top name for me um, thank you thank you i appreciate that a lot. Thank you. yeah yeah for sure um so i feel like this is a pretty good place kind of forward looking to uh to maybe uh end, end this conversation uh for now at least um so again i do want to thank you so much for uh giving your time here um to to talk to me and to help uh, flesh out uh, some of your work and hopefully this will work to help promote your work as well uh so uh, thank you very much for being here thank you so much for this invitation and for this lovely lovely conversation i've had a blast thank you so much yeah of course